Dungeons and Dragons has hordes upon hordes of all kinds of monsters. Classic monsters, contemporary monsters, ugly monsters, beautiful monsters, typical monsters, and weird monsters. Lots and lots of weird monsters. In this video, I'm going to take on the nigh impossible task of selecting the top 10 D&D monsters that I consider the most bizarre and unique. I'm also going to attempt to voice act them. Wish me luck. Before I jump in though, I want to mention this video's sponsor, Geek Tank Games, who just launched a Kickstarter for the upcoming GTG minis, which are ready-made, high-quality 2D minis. Now, you might have noticed that I rarely have any sponsors on this channel. Well, that's because unless a product is something that I actually want to use myself, I just don't promote it. In this case, Geek Tank Games sent me a preview sample of these minis, and I immediately thought they were great. The art alone is bursting with personality and color. The carrying sleeves are really convenient for transportation, and the amount of minis that you get beats the cost of typical 3D minis. I'm really happy to add these to my collection. I've put a link to the Kickstarter campaign down in the video description where you can go and support GTG minis and of course get your own on pre-order. Also, throughout the video I'm going to show off some more of these minis as the monsters come up. So let's jump in. Number 10 is Kinku. One of the strangest and most different of the humanoids in all of D&D is the Kinku. Not only are they a monster, but they can also be played as a character race. The Kinku are a raven folk who were cursed long ago by some powerful entity whom they betrayed. The details are largely erased from history, and the Kinku all share a dream of piecing together this enigma. For their crimes, they lost the ability to fly, as well as their ability to speak like normal people. A Kinku does not have its own voice, but rather it can repeat any sound or any speech that it's heard before. Whether you're a DM or a player running a Kinku, you are therefore only able to talk in sound effects or mimicked quotations of other creatures' voices. You also have a bird's beak and feet and a feathery body. All of this in addition to the fact that your entire race's backstory is one giant mystery. A Kinku walks into a tavern, appearing to be in really high spirits. The tavern keep says, Hey mates, you're looking rather jolly. Did you finally get rid of that shithead boss of yours? Or are you just on holiday? The Kinku replies, Let's just say that I figured out how to get away with the great murder. So the Kinku is odd in its own unique ways. It presents players and DMs with a role-playing challenge when it comes to communication. Speech is such a powerful ability that we all take for granted. I imagine that really getting into a Kinku character would be a psychological experience with potential to reveal something about human nature. Just think about the implications of not having your own voice not possessing the primary means by which a person expresses his mode of being in order to move forward through existence. And at the same time, having to copy other people and other things, like an organic sampler who must draw from a sound bank on the fly, who always has to utilize the way that other people put things. It's no wonder the Kenku race is known for its chaotic alignment, though I would argue that their race's quest to unravel their shrouded and cursed past is a quest to find order and purpose, a lawful side that would bring them into balance and liberation. Number nine, the Gibbering Mouther. This is a simpler creature in many ways, but it's one of the weirdest monsters in all of D&D. It's a mass of flesh covered with an indefinite amount of eyes and mouths, the monster continuously babbles madness, though here and there a coherent word or a phrase comes through the cacophony. Has it just revealed a secret to you? Or was it nothing more than senseless muttering? Unless the DM creates some interesting lore or modifies the gibbering mouther in a unique way, it's really not a complex monster. It's little more than a hungry, insane blob straight out of some Lovecraftian weird tale. 
but what it lacks in depth, it makes up for in repulsiveness and strangeness. Number eight is the Flumpf. The next monster in this ranking is also an aberration, and it's also a really weird one. Well, aberrations are defined by their strange and alien qualities, but the Flumpf is bizarre even amongst aberrations. For one, it's lawful good. It's pretty much the rarest alignment for aberrations. In fact, as of this video's release, the Flumpf is the only aberration in all of 5e that is good aligned. A few are neutral, but the vast majority are some variety of evil. Aberrations often have odd-shaped bodies, but something about the flump is peculiar in its oddness. I suppose it has an almost cartoonish aesthetic, and for that reason I used to dismiss this monster and actually find it annoying. Even its name comes from the sound that it makes as it floats through the air on little propulsions from its body. Flumpf. I'm not even sure how to make that sound. Flumpf. Interacting with a flump, while not terrifying like contact with many other monsters, must still be pretty damn strange, as this hovering jellyfish thing with eye stalks communicates with you telepathically. The only way that it talks is inside of your own mind. There's a lot of nasty lies that go around about us flumps. I hope you don't believe them. They say things like, while you're sleeping, we come and licks your brain. I wouldn't do nothing like that. I just want a little nibble poo on some of those extra thoughts you got in there. Oh, them extras. You know, you're worrying so much lately. Don't need to worry. Just come on, let old Flumpy get a little sippy poo of your extra brain juice. So, Flumps live underground, and they feed off of thoughts of nearby sentient creatures. Such thoughts are said to contain trace amounts of latent psionic energy. Being moral and social creatures, Flumps do not maliciously devour people's memories. They're not victimizers. Instead, they only consume excess mental energy or wayward thoughts. They're the bottom feeders in the food chain of Underdark Mind Eating. Player characters can likely utilize a flump for information or assistance, and unlike with a typical aberration, there's not a lot of risk of this interaction tearing into the character's sanity or opening a portal to some nether corner of the cosmos. Number 7, Quotoa. The seventh slot in this ranking brings us to another humanoid, the Quotoa arguably the weirdest of all the humanoids. Quotoa are subterranean amphibious fish people. No, not the Sawagan, these fish people. They have an array of unique abilities from slippery bodies and sticky shields to otherworldly perception that allows them to see invisible and ethereal creatures to nets and pincher staves to divine spells. Why do they have inclinations to be clerics? Well, I will explain. No, there is too much. I will summarize. In the past, the Quotoa were enslaved by Illithids, aka Mind Flayers. The Illithids subjected the Quotoa to generation after generation of mind-shattering experimentations. This drove the Quotoas to madness and warped their forms. The Illithids considered the Quotoa project a failure and abandoned them. The Quotoa went on groveling and brokenness and terror for a time, then formed into subterranean cults, clinging to religious fervor to shield them against the unspeakable trauma their people had endured. From their very minds, the Quotoa eventually spawned a brood of their own monstrous gods. Their own dreams and nightmares manifested into divine reality. Maul hail the mighty blib dual poop! His yakel spogging knows no bounds. His lacrimious scribs will jabricate your mentals until the last drop of sleep absorbs into his vortical cavity. Some of the other humanoid races can be weird. Three Kreen and Bullywugs immediately come to mind. But if you want the strangest of the strange, nothing beats the Quotoa. Underdark fish people forever scarred by decades of mental torture by mind flayers who are zealot cultists of the monster gods that they birthed out of their own imaginations. 
Number six, Alkalith. Demons are often more horrific or brutish than purely weird, but the Alkalith is an exception. It appears as a patch of slime or mold that grows around a door, a window, or other mundane portal. Once it takes over the opening, the Alkalith corrupts it, transforming it into a gateway to the abyss. So the next time your party is exploring a dungeon and you see slime coating some stony archway, know that it might actually be an Alkalith and in time become a crossover point between the material plane and the infinite realm of demons. The Alkalith can also subject its foes to confusion, which always makes combat a bit weirder. Unfortunately, it does not have the ability to speak, not even through telepathy, so I'm not sure if I can voice act much of it here. Demons are usually wild, savage things bent on frenzied destruction. So it's really curious to see the Alkalith to come across this monster that has the ability to warp a regular door into a demonic portal. It's just such a strangely unique ability. Number five, Oblex. Most oozes are simple, straightforward monsters that just want to consume all organic matter they can. They're pretty cool in their own way, though fairly one-dimensional. The Oblex is an ooze that really breaks the mold. Imagine you're exploring the corridors of an ancient ruin when you spot a lady peeking out from behind an archway. Are they gone? Those awful creatures? Oh, thank heavens you've come. You approach to escort her to safety. But as you come within arm's reach, you notice little strands of goo trailing behind her, and her face and body start to melt into a fast-flowing, sentient slime. When an oblex consumes a creature, it also consumes that creature's memories and knowledge. It can extrude a portion of itself that can change in shape, color, and texture to mimic almost any physical characteristic. It then uses its disguise to lure or trap or otherwise prey upon more victims. This also means that the oblex can be in multiple places at once, separate pieces that all function in unison. Once an oblex consumes enough memories, it grows swollen, and it needs to shed one of the personalities it has absorbed or else be driven insane. This split off portion becomes an oblex spawn, thus beginning a new oblex altogether. Number four, Intellect Devourer. Eating memories and minds is just a recurring theme on this ranking. The Intellect Devourer is an infamous monster of that very persuasion. It is also one of those rare monsters in 5th edition D&D, along with rust monsters, shadows, and ochre jellies that do other kinds of damage besides pure hit point reduction. In this case, the Intellect Devourer can reduce a target's intelligence score to zero. I will admit that I think the creature's body is a bit goofy, being just a brain with a crusty covering that walks on four bestial legs. Of course, that goofiness extends very far into the weird territory as well. Mind flayers create intellect devourers from the brains of their thralls. These extracted brains turned into monsters then hunt the Underdark, hungry to consume intelligence and memories of prey. Once doing so, the intellect devourer then goes inside of the creature's skull. It inhabits the victim's body and uses it like a puppet. You think you own that body? What do you know about bodily possession? Say your last words. I'll remember them after I take over your meat vehicle. This little monster is so unique, so odd. It's also one of the monsters in D&D that's sure to cause a big reaction in the players when they see it appear. Number three, Star Spawn Larva Mage. Continuing with the aberration theme, we come across the Star Spawn, which are a loose grouping of creatures that are connected with the Elder Evils. Who are the Elder Evils? Well, it might be better that you don't ask. But since you did, they are the most malevolent of the Great Old Ones, the awful arch-villains from the Far Realm. The Starspawn are grotesque beings, the minions, the heralds, the soldiers of the Elder Evils. They typically land on the material plane inside of meteors, 
and always have something to do with attempting to bring an elder evil into the world. The Larva Mage is, in my opinion, the most bizarre and freaky of the star spawn. It's usually an emissary of Caius, an elder evil whose colossal form is composed of worms. Likewise, the Larva Mage is a walking maggot heap that dons robes, a mask, and other accessories to maintain a vaguely humanoid shape. It casts spells like Eldritch Blast, Dominate Monster, and Circle of Death, and it infests other creatures with plagues of flesh-eating worms. Your decay is inevitable. You're nothing more than a walking compost heap. Come rejoice in merging with the worm that walks. Is this creature more weird, or more disgusting, or more horrifying? You know, at this point in the ranking, I guess we've passed the point of making such distinctions. Number two, the Mind Flayer. One of the most iconic aberrations in D&D history is the Mind Flayer, aka the Illithid. Octopus-headed, brain-eating, egomaniacal, psionic magic-wielding tyrants. They are memorable and striking in appearance with clear influence from Cthulhu and other Lovecraftian stylings, and their lore is some of the richest and deepest of any monster. They enslave the Gith race in the Astral Sea, and the Quotoas and Grimlocks in the Underdark. They created the Intellect Devourers and Oblexes, and they've warred with many other humanoid races. A Mind Flayer is a hermaphrodite who spawns a brood of larvae by itself two or three times throughout its life. Its little tadpoles swim around in the pool of the colony's elder brain, and those who survived after a decade or so are implanted through the ear canal of humans, elves, or other such hosts. An implanted larva goes on to consume the target's brain, and rupture out of slash become the body's new head. Gods are distant dreams. Heroes are legends found only in song. But the Elethids are here and now. The Elethids are the future made flesh. Mind flayers are just so damn freakishly bizarre. And they're also some of the ultimate villains of the D&D world. I could have easily given them the number one slot on this ranking, but to spite them and to mess with their inflated egos, I gave them second place. That and the number one monster is, I believe, just a tiny hair weirder. The pages of the D&D bestiaries are filled with tons of oddities, so narrowing them down to a top 10 was really quite a challenge. I'd like to take a quick moment here to give some honorable mentions to those that just didn't quite make the cut for this video. We have Otiug, Myconid, Modron, Cranium Rat, Flail Snail, Nilbog, Rotgrubs, Sibriex, Beholder, and Gelatinous Cube. I'm sure there are plenty of others that I could have mentioned, so you are welcome to put your own suggestions down in the comment section below. And now, the weirdest of the weird, the creepiest of the creeps, number one, Vargwheel. When I first got into D&D during the early 2000s, the Vargwheel was one of the first monsters that really stuck out to me. Take a severed head give it bat wings where your ears would normally be, and send it flying around wreaking havoc. It has a stunning shriek, a poisonous bite, and a kiss that inflicts the target with a curse. Each hour the cursed target spins outside of daylight, it loses a point of charisma as the gruesome transformations taking place. And the victim's face becomes more and more fiendish, and his ears stretch out into flopping wing membranes. At a charisma score of two, the target's head rips free from its body and becomes a new Varg wheel. If a Mind Flayer takes you over, you technically die. Your brain and head are destroyed and the rest of your body is transformed. It's a horrific end, but at least it's over. If a Varg wheel takes you over, you continue on in your twisted and vile new form. And I find that to be just a bit more disturbing. Don't be shy now. Give old Pappy Walter a kiss. 
Dungeons and Dragons has no shortage of freaks and wacky critters. This list could have easily been five times longer. I want to leave you with some encouragement to add a bit of oddness into your next D&D adventure. Even if the adventure itself is fairly straightforward, just adding in one minor subplot that is weird, or even just a single side room in the dungeon that has something bizarre in it, can really add a new layer to the experience. For example, the characters are fighting their way through a dungeon, maybe a goblin stronghold or a haunted crypt. They open a door that is not along the main passageway. The room inside has a sputtering, ever-burning torch that throws out flickers of green light. A gaunt, vaguely humanoid creature wearing a face mask is holding a giant wooden spoon. He's methodically beating a gibbering mouther that is chained to a torture rack. In the corner, a little man is hunched down, clutching himself, rocking back and forth, repeating over and over, Grandpappy told us not to touch his spoon collection. Grandpappy told us not to touch his spoon collection. And I had better wrap things up there before this video accidentally tears open a rift into the far realm. Thank you as always for watching, and an extra special thank you to all my patrons who support me over on Patreon. You guys are awesome, and you always give me that extra boost of motivation. Keep D&D &D weird, may your adventures be many.